Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that we have to worship you. God, uh, we do thank you for your many blessings, Lord, even in this time that we're going through. God, you are alive and you are well. And we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I pray that as I speak from your word this morning, God, that the words that come out of my mouth would be acceptable and pleasing to you. For you are our strength and you are redeemer. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. If you have your Bibles or your home and you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be uh, continuing through the parables uh, that Father Nathan's been preaching on. So, Matthew 13 is where we're going to begin today. The verses kind of jump, and our lectionary it goes uh, Matthew 13, 31 through 33, and then it skips over to 44 through 50. But we're going to touch on those a little bit this morning. So, this is going to be more of a homily. I will try to keep this short. I'll try to do the best I can. Uh, there's just so much to unpack in these parables. Um, and what a week. I mean, it's, I don't know about you guys, I feel the same every day. It's the same thing every day. It's the same thing every day. Um, you know, the movie Groundhog Day is proving true, right? You wake up, it's the same thing. And I know a lot of people feel a lot of anxiety because maybe there's not a lot of structure. And that's hard. And so, um, hey, but God is good. Um, we as Christians are still to proclaim the gospel no matter what. And we want the gospel to go forth and to be proclaimed. So I just want to remind you of that, okay? Uh, and it has been a hard week. We've lost some loved ones. Uh, Dennis went home to be with the Lord. That's a beautiful thing. He is with Jesus. I know that hurts us here because in our humanness, we, we love the touch. We like the tangible. We want to be able to see. But Dennis' body has been restored. He's been made whole. And he's in heaven rejoicing with Jesus. And that should make you come alive. And I'm happy because Deacon Tim and I got to serve him communion a couple weeks ago. So he had accepted the body of Christ. And, and that was just a blessing for us. And then we lost the great J.I. Packer, uh, a great theologian. Uh, I would not say he was a personal friend, but through the Anglican world, since he was an Anglican priest, I did get to meet him on multiple occasions. Uh, I had him sign my ESV Bible, and he told me, he goes, you know I didn't write this, right? And I said, I know you didn't write the Bible, but... You put so much into this. I want, your, I want your autograph. And so at home, it's a prize to me that I have his autograph. And he signed it in my Bible. And he signed this beautiful verse from Isaiah. So um, again, God is alive. And we, we are thankful that we are to know him. So starting with the message today. It always starts out. And Jesus is saying the kingdom of heaven is like. And we heard Nathan just read, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. So begins our gospel lesson for today. It's a continuation of these great catalogs, if you will, of these parables that make up the 13th chapter of Matthew's gospel. The kingdom of heaven is like. And so the question we must ask, what is the kingdom of heaven like? And when we hear that expression, I think our pondering generally lifts us out of this world, right? We live here, and God lives in that place that is completely other. Because as we always pray the Lord's Prayer, right? It says, our Father who art in heaven, right? And these words come easily and encourage us to associate heaven Right? It was somewhere else, kind of. But when Jesus came into the world and proclaimed that the kingdom of God is at hand, and he was not talking about some celestial realm, 
He was speaking of the God that the Jewish people knew intimately. And only now, Jesus was claiming that this God was uniquely present through his life and ministry. To describe it, what this would mean for people, Jesus told these parables. He told parables that had an intriguing, captivating, sometimes even destabilizing effect. So when Jesus told his parables, they did not simply describe something or convey information. The parables Jesus told actually made things happen. They reached into the hearts and lives of his listeners and it captured them. Some people felt hope and possibility through these parables. Others, particularly the religious leaders, felt condemnation and judgment. In reality, the parables are just stories. But when Jesus told them, they became the word of God and it seared the lives of those who heard them. So St. Matthew, the great evangelist that he was, he assembled a number of parables of Jesus in the 13th chapter of his gospel. In the past two weeks, we've heard two of them, right? We've heard the parable of the sower and the parable of the wheat and weeds. And today in our gospel, we hear five relatively short parables, all seeking to tell us something about the urgency of being a part of, of the kingdom. So the first two parables in the series, the stories of the crazed farmer who throws seed everywhere and then refuses to do any weeding, tells us about the generosity and the forbearance of God. The parables we hear today speak of the choices that must be made. And these particular stories do not speak of what God is like, but rather how we ought to respond to God. So, if the first two parables are about the surprising nature of God's kingdom, the second set describes the surprise and delight we can experience when we stumble into God's kingdom and find within it a sense of peace and joy and purpose. See, we can do this today, right? It's like, showing a person a set of pictures from your vacation on your smartphone, right? We've done that. We've all done that. Let's just be real, right? So Jesus is giving us a bit of a parable slideshow. And he's telling us stories that reveal small realities of life in God's kingdom. First, Jesus tells us that the grain of mustard seed Although the smallest of all seeds can be grown into the largest of all bushes and can provide the shelter for the birds. So in other words, things are not always as they seem. Moving through the parables, we see a small amount of yeast can grow flour into bread enough to feed a town. Which is not unlike the transforming power that we can experience as a follower of Jesus Christ. And then we have a great treasure unexpectedly found in the field of life. And it reminds us that faith and commitment to Jesus are so important that when our eyes are opened, we must be willing to sacrifice everything we have in order to possess that great gift of faith. And then moving through the parables, we have the priceless pearl. A small thing, right? among the counterfeits and trinkets of life, has far value greater than everything we own. But we must first understand that many people do not. For those of us that who love the Lord, we acknowledge that our faith is the greatest possession that we have, and it's adequate for all life's cha uh, changes and challenges. And finally, the end of the parable, it's talking about the fish net, right? Or the parable of the net. Also, this is teeming with both good and bad. So in other words, right, there's good and bad fish. He uses this parable. And it's a sharp reminder that we must constantly be discerning the virtuous and noble from the corrupt and pointless. We are not to judge other people 
but we are to sort things out in our lives so that we make certain that the most important thing, you've heard this before, is the most important thing. So each of these tales makes it clear that one thing is required. And the sum of the parables makes it clear that if we follow Jesus, it will require everything. So the price for the treasure of God is everything we have. The cost of discipleship is our whole life. So in other words, we cannot be partial followers of Jesus. The kingdom of God, Jesus insists, is like a man who, while plowing a field, hears it. Here's his plow, and it hits something, right? He checks it out, and he finds a buried treasure. How I would love to mow my yard and find buried treasure, just to let everybody know. So first, back in that day, they did not have, right, banks or other public depositories in which they could store their wealth. So there was this increased risk of robbery. And second, we must remember that Israel was the land between the great powers of the world, Egypt to the south, Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, to the east, and Assyria to the north. So every time these nations would go to war, the land of Israel was caught in the middle. So people learned how to protect their wealth from both thieves and from the plundering of the enemy soldiers by burying items. And that included food, clothing, various household objects, as well as gold, silver, and jewels. The first century Jewish historian Josephus wrote, he says this, the gold and the silver and the rest of that most precious furniture, which the Jews had and which the owners treasured underground was done to withstand the fortunes of war. So it was common for the people to bury their valuables. Now, if the person who buried it or died or was taken away as captive, then that treasure would remain buried until someone happened to stumble upon it. Now, some would question the ethics of this man who said nothing but suddenly was interested in buying land and apparently for a small value. So to some of our ears today, we would think this sounds of deception and fraud. But in Jesus' day, the traditional Jewish law was clear. What is found belongs to the finder. Property ownership did not include what was hidden in the ground. So Jesus has not seemed to share our contemporary concern with fairness and legal obligation. He's pretty much saying kind of go for the gold. But he's also saying maybe take a risk. Put everything on the line for the one thing that matters. Grab the treasure. See, there was a time when the people understood that. They knew that faith in Jesus Christ demanded the best that they had and really the best that they could be. There was a Methodist bishop who was a teacher at Duke Divinity uh, School in North Carolina. And he has a small story about this. And he reflects on how eager he was as a young person to find excitement and adventure in life. And he writes this. He says, back then, anybody with a bus leaving to find buried treasure, well, count me in. And he says, oh, but then I got a degree. I got a job. I got tenure. I got reserved parking. And I bedded down. Now, if Jesus were to come up and say, hey, there's buried treasure around the next bend in the road, I would likely have responded. Now, does that include health insurance? Do you guarantee that my sacrifice will be worth it? <laughs> Do we have seatbelts? So perhaps this is the greatest challenge today. Right? Because belonging to a church costs us very little. We're not threatened because of our faith, right? And for most of us, being Christian is an option on a list of preferences for some people to check it off. But as we know, life is short. The only thing worse than not reaching our goals is to set our goals too low. So what does that mean for you and me to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Have we perhaps settled for the wrong treasure? Have we sacrificed faithful commitment to Jesus Christ for what we call here the good life? Those creature comforts and not much of anything else? See, once Jesus walked in Galilee and Judea, calling people to follow him, 
And he explained to them what discipleship would cost. And it's this, rejection, beatings, deserting family, letting the fishing business go, giving up the soft job as a tax collector. And you know what? The people did it. And they followed him. And that's what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. See, that's what these five little parables are about. There's another story. Once when the going was tough and Jesus' enemies were closing in on him, he asked his disciples this question. He says, are you going to leave me? The disciples replied, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So the kingdom of God is still the treasure. And that has to be our response to go after that treasure. And not hoard the treasure, but share that treasure with the world and with our friends so that they may know who Jesus Christ is. Amen? Amen. Amen.